All right, great or greatest commandment. Oh, years ago, who's heard of a newspaper? Yeah, magazine. Yes, there's a few. Thank you for your enthusiasm, John. Now in magazines, particularly, I remember the Woman's Weekly, but other ones, kids' magazines too, they had like quizzes in them and you would answer the questions and you'd get a score depending on what you answered. You get to the end of the quiz and then you'd have some kind of result and then you'd click, connect that with a table. Anyone done those before? And it would tell you things like, I've done plenty of these quizzes and I always get stuff like passionate lover, great listener, awesome bloke. No, I'm just making that up completely, right? But you know what I'm talking about. Now, this isn't a joke. I did one of these quizzes this week um, and it was on Facebook, same sort of idea, except if you're old school, it was in a magazine, now it's on Facebook. And a friend of mine put up this quiz what kind of Anglican are you? What kind of Anglican are you? And we went through and had a whole bunch of really curly kind of questions. And I went through answering them and got to the end. And a bunch of my friends had done this quiz and they got stuff like respectable things like evangelical. Some got old school evangelical. Some got Presbyterian. That's quite all right. Some even got kind of you know, Catholic or that sort of stuff. Fine, that's all great. And you know what I got? I got Puritan. <laughs> Puritan. Now, the Puritans had some problems. We're not saying they didn't. I got Puritan. Now, the Puritans, I don't know if you've heard of the, the whole Salem witch hunt thing. Yeah, and they were kind of burning people at the stake, calling them witches. Well, we can thank the Puritans for that. So that's not such a good part. But any movement has its problems at the extremes. I'm not discounting that. But there were some good things about the Puritans. This is the 16th, 17th century, mind you. And... The Puritan movement has changed the Anglican church. Well, it did, and they're part of us now. First thing they kind of held to was a strict adherence to the Bible. Well, that's great. Good. I love it. Bible first. Scripture alone, as Martin Luther said. Quite simplistic in their worship. So that's, that's fine. They didn't bother with all the smoke. Um, they probably didn't use tambourines. Or maybe they only used tambourines. I don't know. But it was simplistic worship. That's good. They believed in predestination, which is the idea that God chooses those who will be saved. Now, I struggle with that doctrine. It's in the scriptures. I'm quite fair, but I struggle with it because it seems like you know, God's a bit of a meanie leaving some people out. But just because God knows what we will choose doesn't mean we don't have to choose. I'll try and work that one out. It is Trinity Sunday. I'm going to have a few of those this morning. Personal piety, so being doers of the word was important to the Puritans. You've heard me use that phrase before. Yeah, being doers of the word. They believed highly in education, mostly because you, you needed an education to understand the scriptures. And if it's the Bible first, well, then you want to know what you're reading and what you're getting yourself in for. So they believed in education, self-governance. So we are the church, that kind of stuff. The bishops, they can kind of do their thing out there. I never talk like that, do I? They do, yeah, I think I do a bit. They were quite intolerant of other religions and that's where some of the edge of it gets a bit, they get a bit, bit wishy-washy there. Um, but I mean, look, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. So at best, every other religion is a deception, right? And we, we, must, we must face that. High work ethic. I mean, look, this is all me, right? Yep, yep. A Puritan is an Anglican. Make no mistake of that. All they want to do is seek that the church becomes a worthy bride for Christ. That's the purpose of that movement at its heart. And I certainly would subscribe to that today. Why do I bring this up? Well, rarely do we do anything that hasn't been done before. I love it. You come up with a new idea and then you Google it. <laughs> you think it's new. It's not. Other people have these ideas, but they do change for seasons. We look at this great commission of Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. Very simplistic directive, isn't it? I mean, how can you get that wrong? Go make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bring people into the kingdom of God. It's so straightforward. What do we do when we see this command? How do we respond? Do we see this kind of same old, same old? You know, just another preacher trying to offload his responsibility to tell people about Jesus on us. Is that what it is? It could be, or perhaps it's irrelevant. Look, there's a church in every town, isn't there? Why do we need to tell people about Jesus? If they want to go to church, they can. Nobody's stopping them. So maybe this command's kind of irrelevant now. Or is it something old that must be born new in us? 
something new that can be transformative and once again radical now here in this season. That's what I'm hoping for this morning. I'm no Puritan, but clearly some parts of their movement has been rekindled in my walk with Christ because this season needs it. And I hope the same, is the, hope the same can be said for Matthew 18. Big introduction, please pray with me. We will run through it. It won't take us long. Of course, it's gonna take us a while to do. <laughs> Let's pray, Lord. Thank you for your great love. I open the hearts and minds to your word this morning. Amen. Well, the final paragraph, that's what we read. The final paragraph of Matthew's gospel, it takes this kind of, this defeat, this great tragedy as it might have been of Golgotha where Jesus was crucified and it turns it, transforms it into a triumph for the kingdom of God. This final paragraph that we read of Matthew's gospel is not really an end, is it? It's the beginning, the beginning of Christ's mission through us on earth. Let's have a look at it. Matthew 28, verse 16. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So Jesus has died. This is the risen Jesus. They've gone to him on the mountain, but some doubted. Some doubted. Don't we find that a bit odd at this point of the story? Some doubted. Let me kind of unpack this with a bit of an illustration. Justin Briley, he runs a podcast. That's a radio kind of broadcast for the old school people amongst us. This podcast, and he gets together atheists and Christians and they kind of bash it out. They talk about things of God. They might talk about political issues, maybe things like abortion or all sorts of things. Um, and and they, they're trying to get the atheist response and the Christian response to see how they go. It's, it's a great show episodes go for about an hour. So it's no small thing. Now, I remember listening to one of these podcasts, these radio broadcasts um, a little while ago. I can't remember the name of the atheist. He was a scientist of many, many years. He was retired and he was a staunch atheist. I can't remember his name. I went looking for it the other day and I couldn't find it. But I do remember what he said when he was prompted with this question at the end of the broadcast. What would it do for you to believe that Jesus is God? What would it take? for you to believe that Jesus is God. And this atheist, and I remember it because his answer seemed so unscientific, just so kind of head in the sand type of answer. He said, nothing, nothing would ever convince me that Jesus is God. Wow. And then he went on to say, even if I met the risen Jesus, I saw him face to face, I had some kind of miraculous thing that happened, I wouldn't believe, I still wouldn't believe, instead, I check myself into a mental institution. Here we are, the church. We are the mental institution, right? <laughs> God is real. <laughs> Jesus is his son. Nothing he said. All right. The disciples doubted too, but it was not like this atheist. The disciples were doubting here in these final words. And we can get a kind of bit more of an insight into what's going on when we look at this word doubt. In the Greek, it's dystasio, and it actually doesn't mean a closed mind or a settled unbelief. When we talk about doubt, it's often they doubt means they're never going to think or believe, doesn't it? That's not what this word means. It's, a, it's not a closed mind. It's not a settled unbelief. Doubt refers to an uncertainty, a hesitation. Now, does that help a little bit? It's an uncertain thing, a hesitation. I mean, who wouldn't respond to this risen Jesus in all his glory, speaking to them on a mountain with, without having a bit of kind of hesitation and uncertainty? Could this be real? Could this be true? That's what's going on here. But then Jesus speaks and he speaks some words, words that are designed to remove all dystasio, all doubt, what does he say? Verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Big words. These words remove the doubt. These are the words of scripture. This is Daniel chapter seven. 
This is what Jesus is speaking about. This is what he's referring to. In Daniel chapter 7, an Old Testament book, hundreds of years before Jesus, Daniel's speaking in a time of great oppression and he's speaking a prophecy, words for God, a great distagio, and he says this. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. See the first person speaking of what they're seeing. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days, that is God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Book of Revelation says all will worship the Lamb. There's no exception. Believers, unbelievers, they're going to come before Jesus on their knees and they will worship him. It will be too late for many, but all will say his name. All will believe at one point that Jesus is God. Jesus, who has all authority on heaven and earth, quotes the scriptures to back up his claim. Why? Because the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is God speaking to us and we can trust it just like we can trust Jesus. And he gives us this great commission in verse 19. Therefore, and therefore just means because of everything I've just said, therefore, because I have power and authority, I can tell you what comes next. Because I have a power and authority that I'm gonna to give to you, I can say what comes next. Because I have the word which I'm giving to you and spirit, I can say what comes next. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What just happened? What do we see here? Do we see this kind of same old, same old? I've heard this all before. It's just some preacher, 12 foot from contradiction. You know how they had the old pulpits? You know, our churches had these, they used to go up a stairs and climb up and then they could look down on everybody and the joke was he's, he's you know, nine foot from contradiction because he's way up high. Is that what we've got here? A, a minister who we pay trying to palm off on us the responsibility of sharing the gospel and going with the good news? Certainly some people read it like that. But is this irrelevant? Again, there's a church in every town in our country pretty much. If someone wants to go to church, there's nothing stopping them. So it's irrelevant. We're not going to Bible bash people, are we? If they don't want to go, that's their problem. Or do we see something new? You have the Holy Spirit in you. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ in you. I don't need to preach this. It's in your heart. What is the Spirit saying to you about these words of Christ? His final words recorded in the book of of Matthew. And final words are important, yeah? We often, we just search on Google, famous last words, and you will get hundreds and hundreds of people trying to kind of have, you know, with their final say. Some are great, some are not so great. Because final words matter. They're important. I collected a list this week just for a bit of fun. And I've got a few here. Some of my favourites, people's final words. Bob Marley, his final words were, money can't buy life. You got that right, mate. Good job. That's quite profound, isn't it? It'd be nice to work that out earlier in your life than kind of on your deathbed, but good on you, Bob Marley. Uh, Oscar Wilde, he, he said, either that wallpaper goes or I do, and then he died. Good one. <laughs> and this one's a bit sexist. It's from a French nun. She says, a woman who can fart is not dead. <laughs> what, what do you do with that one? Famous last words for French, none. Winston Churchill, I'm bored with it all, and he dies. I'm sure he could have done better. Got him on a bad day, perhaps. <laughs> or Bessie Smith, I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. Now, there's some final words that I would love to share in. But I've got another one, Martha Roberts. She said this, she said, Hush, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Martha Roberts has got a plaque right there. 
She was the first minister's, or well, the wife of the first minister of this church 140 years ago. Her final words recorded on that plaque. Final words are important. Her final words have outlived her generation and they'll likely outlive ours. Final words matter. Hush, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Timothy Keller, I talked about him a few weeks ago, two weeks ago when he passed away. He was a good mentor of mine. I mean, I didn't know him, but a mentor in the sense that I sat under his preaching and the way he unpacked God's word. I encourage everyone, anyone, look at his, listen to his, sir. They're wonderful. Um, greatest evangelical voice of our generation, I think, would be, wouldn't be unreasonable to suggest. I really like what his family put on Twitter. And for those who are old school amongst us, Twitter's like the, you know, the feedback column of the newspaper. Yeah. And they wrote this on there about his passing away. I think I got a slide of it. Yes. Said this, husband, father, grandfather, mentor, friend, pastor, and scholar, that's Timothy Keller, died this morning at home. Dad waited until he was alone with mum. She kissed him on the forehead and he breathed his last breath. We take comfort in some of his last words. Who wants to know what his last words are? They didn't write them down. The post, the purpose of it, dot, dot, dot. It's for you, the people whose lives were impacted by Timothy Keller's work. You ought to write his last words and how he impacted you. And there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people writing the ways he impacted them. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything I've commanded you and I'll be with you to the end of the age. These are Jesus' final words in Matthew's gospel, but they are not the end of the story. They are not really his final words because his final words live in you. The final words of Jesus live in you. They manifest in what you do with the faith, the gift that you have been given. If you do nothing, then his final words remain dot, dot, dot. If you do something, then the mission of Christ continues. The story is continuing to be told in you for all eternity. But what if you've come to church this morning and you're not quite sure about all of this stuff? Maybe the, commission, the Great Commission is still six foot above contradiction, irrelevant. Perhaps that's still the case. Have you ever been to a wedding? Now, weddings are different when you're not married and you've never been married and you go to a wedding. It's lovely. You're brought to tears for one reason. When you go as a married person, you're brought to tears for a different reason. Yeah, that was another joke that I'm not supposed to tell in a sermon. <laughs> but weddings are powerful, aren't they? Two flawed people coming together, promising to be with each other till death do they part, and it's always moving. Even the most stoic amongst us are usually affected. I've seen a great many dads, particularly. Dads are the worst. They cry their eyes out at weddings. Gutless, I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm sure I will, just between you and me. But like you see that love, you see that people coming together, the two becoming one. That's who we are in Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Together, we join with Christ. We promise to be with him until death do us part, except we never part. Our story truly begins at the resurrection of us all. And that is a beautiful and wonderful thing to be part of. Unless you go to a crappy church, then it's not so good. That was another joke, because this is not a crappy church. You are welcome, be with us. Together we get to write the story of Matthew 18 together for eternity. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for involving us in your mission, your plan, your purpose. Help us to be convicted of what we can do to be part of that. Be with us, Lord Jesus, as we worship and praise you. Be with us this week as we push through trials and troubles. And Lord Jesus, we all look forward to that day where we will get to see you face to face and we will truly be 
and completely be sanctified. Amen.